ask me whatever question you want to ask me. I love that backdrop. Look at that. I know. It's right. It's cool, right? Yeah, it's awesome. It almost looks professional. It looks like you're in the swamp. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like that, too. They, they can't see that. Oh, they, I, I don't see that. They see this. Yeah. But uh, I didn't know how this was going to work out, so I didn't know if I was going to need it. Uh, it's, it's my mama. My mama was from Louisiana. She was born and raised in French waters. And that brings back memories of when I was a kid going out to the swamp to see my cousins, the Ludons. <laughs> right. All right. Testing. Testing, testing. One more time. Testing. There, All right. we go. there it is. Okay. Whew. I was worried. I thought my biggest interview of my lifetime and my microphone doesn't work. <laughs> well, it's that damn off and on switch. You got to hit it. <laughs> right. I usually don't have them, but for this, yeah. in this case, I it was best to have. Well, I, I put them on all my girlfriends. I wish I could. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could. You know, I wish I had the, I wish I had that problem at all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Jeez. So listen, hey, everybody. It'd be great if they came with an off and on switch, oh, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah. Just, just say yes, dear, and everything will be fine. Yes. <laughs> so listen, everybody, I'm John Michael, and this is the world-famous Steve Scarfino, the original guitarist of Ario Speedwagon, and he has blessed me and you with his presence here uh, on the John Michael Show. That's a handful right there. <laughs> um, uh, so how how uh, how did you do at the show? Did oh, you we you know we did great. It's Jimmy's inaugural uh, show. Is that how you say it? Yeah, it's his first. It's yeah, his first yeah. show, yeah. and uh, I wanted to come up and support it for him, and we did, and it was a great. We uh, sold a pretty good amount, and. Not as much as I wanted. Well, that never happened. That, that, well, sometimes it does, but it, 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 it I, so I was hoping for more, but it was still good to come up here and support it. Right. I, I communed with a lot of people, met a lot of people, and, um, you know, it was great. But, but I'll tell you something that just happened. This guy brought in this old lap steel and i collect lap steels and it's one i've been looking for for about 30 years jeez a, a singing hawaiian it's called and it's all metal and it's got a horseshoe pickup on it which is a rickenbacker pickup and somebody spray painted the whole thing including the strings and the tuners and everything but i really wanted it so i like offered him 600 bucks and he bought it at a thrift store for $25. No. And um, so he said, oh, yeah, that's great. I, I'd like to sell it to you. And then I said, well, let me plug it in make sure. So I tuned it up. The strings are all loose. And then I, so I got it and I got it all in tune. And I played it and made it sound good. Yeah, yeah. They saw that on my Facebook. And I... uh, then the guy goes, man. I never knew it could sound like that. I'm sorry, I can't sell it to you anymore. <laughs> it's, well, you tell him it, did, it doesn't sound that good. I make it that good. Unless you're me, it's not going to sound that good. So that was one of the big deals for me today. I wait for those special uh, guitars to walk in. That's heartbreaking. And I was like, 30 you know, years. You, you know, you're breaking my heart right now. And he goes, Yeah, I know, but after hearing you play it, I can't sell it. <laughs> so I, my, my, significant other of 32 years kathleen she goes god damn it i told you not to play those instruments when they bring them in because you keep doing that yeah <laughs> uh hey guys the chat line is open if you want to chat here on the john michael show and if you have a question for steve just put it up on the board he sees it i see it so that's cool now steve i asked you this last night we talked a little bit after the show with jimmy warren and um, I didn't want to get too much into it because I was really, really waiting for this moment right now. Okay. You left Ario Speedwagon just before they started recording Big. Yeah, we had the record deal. And uh, you know how rock and roll bands go. There is a lot of drama going on. 
that point in history, there was a lot of rock and roll environment, drugs and stuff going on. Right. And there was a lot of jealousy from different members in the band. And I was a kid. I was like 21 when I left the band. And there was a couple of guys that were real jealous of the fact that I was getting a lot of attention. And rather than dealing with that, I thought, well, I'll just go on and do something else. Um, so I remember going to Hervé's office and going, man, I'm leaving the band. And he's like, oh, my God, you can't do that. I just, after all this time, I got a record deal. But I went ahead and did it. And now, 50 years later, they're still playing sold-out concerts all over the world. And, and uh, maybe it was a mistake. Maybe it wasn't. We all got to take our own path in life, you know? So when you left Dario Speedwagon, what did you do with yourself? Well, you really want to know the truth? Yeah. This, I mean, it, it, okay. if you, it, look, if you want to say it, say it. If you don't want to say it, don't say it. No, okay. Well, okay. We're in Kankakee, which is kind of near Rockford and Belvedere. Mm -hmm. So um, I had this girlfriend, and um, she was an artist that came from Belvedere, and her dad owned a, f a farm and 9,600 acres. Wow. And... I had this vision of becoming a pot farmer. Oh, a little and ahead of your so time. So I decided to stop playing music and come up to outside of Belvedere and and uh, be a farmer and work for her dad and then right, right. throw my stuff on the side. Yeah, yeah. So I planted all this stuff along the fence lines and he came by with, you know, like chemicals and killed it all. And then I was driving a tractor and it's raining on me. And when I don't know if you've ever been on a tractor, but you go about two miles an hour. And his fields were like two miles long. So you'd be like you're on this tractor. And this was like the old days when the tractors didn't have cabs. And right, stuff. right. They'd be drizzling on you. Yeah. And you'd, it'd take an hour and a half to get across the field. Then you had to turn around and go all the way back. And then you'd have to turn around and go all the way back across. And I'm like, no, I don't think this is working out. So, so uh, I got a call from um, a guy, and he said, we've got this band, and, and uh, we want you to just come down and play with it and start writing some songs, because that's the same reason REO yeah, hired me, because they heard I wrote songs. Right. I did the original demos that got them their record deal. Wow. Um, so the same thing with Pavlo's dog. They had a house gig at a place called the Chase Park Plaza, which is a real fancy hotel down in St. Louis. And um, so I went down there and came home to my hometown and joined this band called Pavlo's Dog. And we eventually got the biggest record deal in the history of rock and roll with CBS Records, and, um, but we had a crooked manager who stole all the money, and it was, it was a fabulous band, but in the end, what difference does it make if you don't get anything out? That's, that's you know? wrong, man. And I was actually talking, I don't know what his name is, but one of the dealers here was in Badfinger, mm -hmm. and he had played, he, gone to Abbey Road and recorded and played gigs with Denny Lang from the Moody Blues and all this stuff. And he was here today. He was set up right on the other side of me. And we talked enough. That was one of the guys I communed with today. And so it's, it's neat to do these shows. You get to talk to people and, you know, it's just an exciting. Plus, I'm a guitar player. And a banjo player. Yeah, a little bit. And a mandolin player. <laughs> a little bit. All those things were here today, plentiful. And it so it was really exciting. And uh, like I said, I wish we would have sold a little bit more, but we did okay. And uh, Jimmy Warren treated us really great. So it he put was, on a nice show. It was a fabulous experience. Yeah. You know, for me. And uh, I'll be back next year. And uh, maybe that'll be the year that we go over the top with selling it.
So now you also do antiquing, am I correct? Yes, um, Kathleen and I have, well, that's a long story. I had actually quit playing music because, you know, the rock and roll environment, sometimes you get in trouble with it. And I had a couple of ex-wives and kids that I had to support. And I thought, okay, I got to get away from this environment for a little bit and raise my kids. So. I quit playing for about 15 years and did that. Then when I came time for me to start playing again, which is my true passion in life. Right, right. The guitars I used to play, like I had a Flying V and a old Les Paul and an old Stratocaster. Now these guitars were worth $25,000, you know, $50,000. So there's no way I could afford Oh, so you sold off all your equipment? Yeah, I I had done that long time. Right. And uh, ago, and uh, for lawyers and all kinds of child support, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, so we started going around to um, garage sales, estate sales, auctions, looking for the tools I needed to get back into playing. And it, while we're doing that, we would see something over here like. A set of English china or sterling silver and we get interested in it and this one time about 32 years ago I bought a set of china for $225 and it was a Mason's set from the 1860s and um, we wound up selling it for 10 grand and then we were hooked like, yeah. Oh my God, we could make a living doing that. Yeah, this is better than gambling. It's better than gambling for sure. And so we really got in it and we took a couple of years and all we did was, it was right when uh, like eBay came out and we would just study the prices of things. And wow, we must have bought 150, 200 books on different items, you know, and we would study it and study it and study it go to antique malls and we look at the pricing on things talk to people talk to old-time antique dealers and so we got pretty good at it and and at this point we can go anywhere in the country and we're well received just like I was well received here at the guitar show but my life's pretty good you know it's yeah like, except for these damn flies yeah there are a few <laughs> flies fucking fairground shit yeah yeah that's you know there's they have you know, they sorry car shows and pig shows. People grade their pigs and their chickens and stuff. And uh, then you come and do a guitar show at the fairgrounds, and damn, the flies are still there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're looking for shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excuse my French, but but. Uh, so you did the antiquing, and now you're you get into the guitar show and and buy sell trade on 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 instruments and. And, 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 and uh, yeah, we brought, I'll tell you where we made most of our money today was we brought two cases of Indian jewelry, like, you know, Navajo pieces and Hopi pieces and, um, sign stuff with turquoise and that's, you know, artist made, you know, jewelry. And we, we made a lot of money selling that today at a guitar show. And, uh, they were actually happy that we brought it. Yeah. So, and, um, and so that's pretty much, we like just go with what works. <laughs> so what, uh, what do you have planned for the future? Uh, well, we'll continue doing, I got one thing as I do the Indiana guitar show with Eddie Prater and right. that's a really good show. Right. And Eddie was helping out Jimmy getting started here today. Right. Right. And, uh, so, you know, it's kind of like a community you got to work yourself into. Then then all of a sudden everybody knows you in that community. And uh, there was a guy next to me or behind me, and his brother died. And his brother had these incredible instruments. And when, and when we first got here, he had a complete booth filled up with just amazing guitars and he actually sold one guy spent seventy thousand dollars how much seventy thousand 
Here, today. Today, yeah. His name's Alan. I don't know what his name right, is. Right, right. But there was a couple of real big buyers here. Unfortunately, that guy was set up behind us, and he was really kind of cutting the prices because he was getting rid of an estate. Right. It wasn't. It, and, it, it, and there it was an amazing estate. And so that I wish that that guy would have spent $70,000 with me rather than that guy. But I was happy for him. Right. And um, when I get off this interview, I'm going to run over there and try to buy a few things he has left. <laughs> Ah, uh, so. it's been a busy day. I'm sorry it took me so long to get over. No, here. listen, I, I told you from the beginning, your business is first. Yeah, and then you now. know when when this all calmed down, I'll I'll I'm waiting for you. And uh, yeah, well, and I, I'm just grateful that you're here. I just can't believe that Steve Scarfini's on the John Michael show. Well, and I'm having I'm see, having an interview. See with the him. shirt; it's a Steely Dan shirt, and I started playing in 1964, and my first band was with Michael McDonald. He was 11 and I was 13. Wow. And uh, I'm still a huge fan of Michael. I mean, he's like the most righteous guy you'll ever meet. And he's so talented. You know, you meet a lot of these rock stars and they're real prima donnas. And then you meet a guy like him. Yeah. That's got this God given, like God came down and touched Michael and said, you have the voice. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but he's so humble. It's just like, he's an amazing guy. So I always try to support him in any way that I can. Yeah. Now you, you know him personally, obviously. Well, but yeah. you, you played since you're 11. Do you guys we, still talk? Yeah, we recorded uh, three songs together over COVID where I'd send him the tracks mm -hmm. and then he would put his vocal on it right and then send me the back track back and we'd right finish it in a studio in st louis and also about 10 years ago he had he had a studio that he built in nashville tennessee actually leapers fork which is just west of nashville and he said just go down and record yourself a, a new cd and so i spent like three weeks down there and did a, a Soul Steel CD. I have a band called Soul Steel. And um, so that was great. Mike's, like I said, he's so talented. And I love him and he loves me. And we're like brothers. You know, we grew up on the same block. And um, now, where, what is your hometown? Ferguson, Missouri. Everybody knows about Ferguson, but it's really a beautiful place. Yeah. It's not like you might think of it from watching the news and all the shit that happened there you know i actually when i would see on cnn they'd actually kind of refer to ferguson as almost being a ghetto i was like what are they talking about i grew up in this big beautiful victorian house it was like you know like I had an well it's news and that's what that's yeah. what i don't like about the big media they'll they'll take yeah. a you know something beautiful they'll make it ugly just for thinking for sales yeah exactly you know um but no i recorded a friend of mine his name's mike Meese, and uh he uh, came to me and said well when i was playing with chuck berry because he was chuck's drummer for many years uh, i was doing a solo project and i asked johnny johnson if he would come over and record on my CD and he, he did. And while he was in the studio, he, um, he asked Johnny, he said, man, can you do a version of Johnny be good for me? Cause Johnny Johnson was Chuck's original keyboard player. Right. And there's a lot of controversy about who really wrote Johnny be good. Right. And uh, what happened story I always heard was, Johnny liked to drink a lot and he oh. was out of money. He was after a gig playing the piano and he showed Chuck the song and uh, Chuck said, you know, can I buy that song for you? And Johnny sold it for 25 bucks. Wow. So anyway, when Chuck came to Chicago to Chess Records, he didn't bring the band. He used a different keyboard on it. 
So Johnny Johnson never actually played on the song Johnny Be Good. Wow. And so the recording I did, Mike said, I love your steel guitar playing. Will you put your steel guitar on it and do an arrangement of it? I said, sure, man. And then I did it and it turned out really good. And uh, so I called Mike up and I said, hey, Mike, you want to sing on a track with Johnny Johnson playing keyboards? And uh, he did, and it turned out fantastic. You can go on YouTube and put in Misi Scarfina or Mike McDonald, Johnny Be Good, and you can listen to it. And I play my 1932 Rickenbacker fry pan in it. It sings and screams, and it's. And then there's one little part where I play a lead. And at the end, I do this really high thing, and Mike kind of screams. And it, it's like a moment where two young buddies play together after 50 years. <laughs> anyway, you'll have to check it out. And I'm really proud of that one. And it was going to be used for a documentary on Johnny Johnson, but it never the movie never came out. So, But it is on YouTube. You can check it out. Oh, we will. You know, most definitely. And uh, so then I re I recorded a couple of other things with him. We did a COVID song and uh, that was real neat. We also had Bonnie Bramlett sing on it. Um, Bonnie is from Granite City, which is right across the river from St. Louis. And she moved back home. And uh, so anyway, I played in Granite City a couple of times and uh, she came out and sang with me. And so she wound up on one recording I did with Michael. And you can see it all on YouTube. So. Nice. So yeah, after 50 years, we're still buds and- That's cool, man. Have done some things together. That's cool. I mean, that's just really cool. I mean, it's, you don't hear that much. Yeah, you know, you don't, you know. I mean, I don't, I, how old are you? 50. 50? Uh, well, for you ladies, I'm 38. 38. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm 49, actually. Yeah. Actually, I was born in 1949. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really old. You can figure it out for yourself. Mm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, how many friends do you have from when you were like None. eight years None. old? None. I don't have any friends now. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm your friend. I just met you yesterday. <laughs> we'll be friends forever now. <laughs> That's what I mean. We go out and do these shows and meet people and commune, and it's pretty gratifying, you know? So even though the show wasn't over the top for us, there was a lot of really good things about it. And I got to play with Jimmy Warren last night at a club yeah, that where was I cool. met you. And um, so I am... Um, Pretty. I've been playing music for 59 years, and uh, so I'm like 72 years old. And so when I get to go out and play and put on a show, it it's it's great for me. And down in St. Louis, I play all the time, but I don't get to travel like I used to. And um, you know, um, but I'm still rocking. Yeah, he is. You know. Yeah, you are. It might be in a rocking chair, but I'm still rocking. Rocking is rocking, baby. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> no, you, you sounded great last night, and I'm going to add that to this uh, to this interview. Oh, great! Or I call it a conversation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, life is really good to me right now because uh, I have a, the love of my life, Kathleen. And me travel all around doing antique shows and occasionally playing concerts, occasionally doing guitar shows. And um, I have two beautiful kids and they're both doing great. My daughter's getting married in England. Wow. Imagine she's going to England to get married. And I'm like, well, I don't know about that. But okay, I'll go to England with you to get married. You're a destination wedding. Right, right. And, and my son is doing fantastic, although this is crazy. He uh, got hit by a car. He was riding his bicycle three nights ago. Oh, Jesus. And he, and he didn't break any bones, but he tore his ligament in the shoulder real bad. And they took him in an ambulance to the hospital. He's all right. 
Right. But I mean, as a father, when something like that happens, right, right, you go, oh my god. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's like a heartbreaker. And uh, but he writes for the Riverfront Times. He's had two cover articles, which is the big magazine down in St. Louis. Right. And he also has a regular job, and he's bought a great big beautiful house. Actually, doing a lot better than <laughs> what no, I ever did. He wasn't a musician. Yeah. You know, I, I made a lot of mistakes over my life. <laughs> well, life is about learning, man. Yeah. And I think that my kids do so good because they've learned from all my mistakes. You know what? If that's the value you can bring to them, yeah. it's worth it. Yeah, definitely. Right. And so... um well, I think they're kicking us out. Are they kicking us out? I yet? mean, it's like they're closing up the walls on behind us. Yeah, I think they probably are. And, uh, man, there were some people that were just getting ready to pack, and I was trying to work a deal with them, but I wanted to come over and see you, <laughs> you know? Uh, I very much appreciate it. As it, a matter of fact, we'll have dinner after the show. That'd be great, man. Um, we'll go get, uh, I don't know, you know, steaks or something? Well, we like, well... All kinds of. I mean, All right. Well, listen. We'll talk after the thing. We'll we'll yeah, love dinner. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, actually, there's a really good Mexican restaurant right next to the, the Hilton Hotel. Is it? Was it good? I was. I thought it was. Great. I was invited to it last night, but I was, I was just. I had so much going on. I was tired. Yeah, I got. It. I, that was my excuse. Yeah. I was tired. And uh, I don't know what time they close, but. We'll find something good. We we went to this one restaurant in downtown Kankakee and it was spectacular it was like one of these famous chefs that learned how to be a chef in Chicago mm. and then opened up his own restaurant <laughs> and uh so we've had a really good trip plus I on the way up here of course we got to stop at every pawn shop that we in every little city and I bought a couple of really neat things on the way up here and bought some really good things here too. So great, man! I'm going home with a bunch of new toys. And... Great. All right, everybody. Steve Scarfino. Am I saying it correctly? Scarfina. Scarfina. Well, interesting enough, there was my grandfather and his brother came over there at Ellis Island, and neither of them could. They're from Sicily, you know. They couldn't speak the language, so on one of the certificates it says Scarfina. Mm -hmm. And then I have a whole batch of relatives that are Scarfinos because one of the brothers was a Scarfino and was really my name is Scalophony. And uh, there's this beautiful city in Sicily right near Palermo. And uh, it's on my bucket list in life to go there. I looked at like these videos from it and it's like in the godfather movie when he goes back to italy these right. beautiful hills and these little beautiful houses that go up a mountain there's a templar's there's a templar's castle on the top of them of sicily mountain city and then there's like a church that was built in the uh 12th century and stuff so that's on my bucket list to get there and uh, I hope I get there in the next year or so. Well, let's let's yeah. get it done. Yeah, so then I'll change my name back to Scalophony again. There you go. <laughs> It'd be, nobody will know who you are. Yep. Yes, definitely. All right, everybody. I'm John Michael. This is Steve Scalophy. Scalophony. Scalophony. But I am Scarfina. And all my relatives are Scarfinos. <laughs> Is that bizarre? Or what? Yeah. Well, I, I kind of have the same thing going on. It all depends on who's, who wrote it down at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for watching. And please like and subscribe to The John Michaels Show. And don't forget to check out the new Hanover Hangover podcast Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m. All right, Steve. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'll sign up for the... For the podcast. Oh, I, I you know, appreciate um, it. Absolutely.